Well, here we are. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I bought your book several weeks ago, I walked into the bookstore, I picked it up, I went to the counter, and the woman who was taking my charge card said, you won't be able to put it down. And I have to tell you, I went home, put myself in a chair, and continued until I got to the end. It, it's just such a compelling read, so beautifully crafted. Where did this idea come from, an American marriage? Well, I started, this book took me six years to write. This is because of the manual typewriter. <laughs> I love composing on a manual typewriter. I like how much effort it takes. I feel like when I use a computer, I'm typing so fast that I don't know what I'm typing. When I use a computer, it feels like it does when you eat too fast. Like, your plate is empty, so obviously you ate it, but you don't really remember eating it. <laughs> so the typewriter slows me down. I also love making all that noise on the typewriter. Mm. You feel like you're getting something done mm -hmm. when you're making all that noise. but. This book took me six years to write because I had a hard time finding the story that I, was, that I needed. I had been awarded a fellowship to Harvard, the Radcliffe Institute, to research the subject of mass incarceration. And I did a lot of research on the topic, and I was outraged, I was angry. I learned statistics that'll keep you up at night, um, one that keeps that I can't quite get out of my mind is that one in 28 children in the United States has a parent in prison. And I would think about these things all the time, but I'm a storyteller and I didn't have a story. I've always thought that you should write about people and their problems, not problems and their and people. people. And I had a problem, but I didn't have people. And I didn't know what I was gonna do about it. Just imagine the clock is ticking, at the Radcliffe Institute, we have to give a presentation of our work. And I had been working, but I didn't have any work to show. So I went home to Atlanta to visit my mother, as I do when I'm upset. And I also went to the mall, as I do <laughs> when I'm upset. And while I was in the mall, I went to the food court for a little snack, as I do when I'm upset. And while I was there, I saw a young couple. Um, the woman was really beautifully dressed, and the man she was with, he looked okay, but she looked fine. She looked just gorgeous, you know what I mean? And he looked mm. okay. And like, you know how the old people, I don't know if old people still say this, but when I was coming up, the old people would say they were unequally yoked. Do people say that up north? <laughs> but I noticed them, and she did not look like the kind of woman to be arguing with her man in the food court. But it could happen to anyone, I was not judging, trust me, I was not, I know it happens. But she said to him, Roy, you know you wouldn't have waited on me for seven years. And I looked and I felt like he knew it, she knew it, and I knew it, that he probably would not have waited on her for seven years, we mm -hmm. knew this. But he turned and looked at her and he, and he said, I don't know what you're talking about, this wouldn't have happened to you in the first place. And again, I felt we all three knew that he was probably right. And I know I have a novel when I have a situation where the characters are both right, yet they don't agree. And that's when I got the idea to write a novel about a young couple separated by his wrongful incarceration. So it, it centers on these two main characters. And then there are a number of other characters. But these two main characters, I just wondered how it's like casting a play. You make them such complete characters in, in the course of the book. You keep coming back to them. So we see the world through her eyes, through his eyes, through the eyes of a third party. And I was wondering how you compose that. I mean, it, it seems to me logistically such a difficult task. Well, part of what took me so long to write the book is that I couldn't make a decision about point of view. When I wrote the novel the first time, I wrote it all from the wife's position. I was very interested in the collateral effects of incarceration and also the demands made of women under these circumstances. And so I wrote the novel, I wrote it all the way through, but it didn't feel entirely complete. I felt like there was a big part of the story that I couldn't get at just from her point of view. And I thought that maybe I should add his voice, but I resisted it a bit because I felt like so many stories are consumed with that 
dominant male point of view and it kind of went against my my project but I felt that I couldn't tell the whole story unless I told it intersectionally so then I rewrote the whole book from his point of view and you would think that it would be harder writing a, a male point of view and I'm a woman but I wrote it so easily and I realized that I wrote it so easily just for what I said it was a story that I already knew one man versus the system and all he wants is to come home is to come home to like a virtuous woman and a clean house. Mm -hmm. And well. the reason it seems so familiar is that this is not only a mainstay of African American literature, but if you think about it, isn't that what the Odyssey is about? Mm -hmm. This is what the Odyssey is about. Mm -hmm. And the Odyssey was written in 70 BC. Mm -hmm. So I realized that I had a character who in the present day has the same desires as a man from 70 BC. And so I decided that I would toggle their two voices. And I felt like the story was getting closer, but it wasn't quite done because I think with Roy being a black man, wrongfully incarcerated for a sexual assault, he was feeling too symbolic. Like I felt the way I was writing it, it felt like the novel was suggesting that despite your education, despite your best intentions, you will end up in prison. And he was, he was standing in for a capital, the black man. And when you start thinking of characters symbolically, they start getting flat. It just, you can't help it. And so there, it's just like in real life. I'm sure we've all been in a situation where you felt like you were representing more than yourself. Maybe you were the only woman in the room, the only black person, the only person from your family. I mean, that also, even though family is a small thing, when you feel you're representing your family, you feel you have to, be on your best behavior. And I felt like the characters were acting that way. But once I added the, the second male voice, Andre, I felt that it, Andre gave Roy room to be himself and Roy gave Andre room to be himself. And once I had the three, I felt like, oh, here's this novel. I f it feels whole to me. So I counted pages and chapters and I was trying to figure out which voice had the most. And you say that actually, all three characters are represented at about the same level. Well, Roy and Celestial have the same amount and Andre has fewer. Okay. But Roy, I feel like Roy's, Roy's chapters feel like they take up more space because his challenge is so great. Yeah. And so it, and that was a problem in balancing the novel that I felt ended up being a conflict in the novel, just as for Celestial, Roy's challenges are so great that it tilts all playing fields toward his needs, I felt like it was happening in the actual book itself. And the challenges she faced as a character were the same challenges I faced as a writer. When I was working on this book, I would have my early readers, my friends who read for me, and everyone was getting kind of upset by the conceit of the novel, that it was a novel in which Roy is wrongfully incarcerated, but it's about more than that thing. And just as Roy gets kind of frustrated when anyone thinks about the book is more than that thing readers were. So I was really kind of, I felt kind of hamstrung by it, but then I decided to like lean into it and help that help me empathize with the characters. How did it happen or how did it come to you to do that 50 pages of letters from to and from prison? That's such an important part of the book. Well, I write letters. I write letters in real life. I've, I've run into that in your, some of your background material. I write letters all the time. And people I'm, don't write you back. Nobody writes me back. Yeah. <laughs> like my own mother. I write my mother a letter every Sunday. I wrote her a letter this morning. I send her the letter on Sunday. On Thursday, she texts me and says, got your letter. <laughs> Thank every you very week. much. <laughs> but, I like letters and I have always been drawn to epistolary novels, you know, mm -hmm. ever since ever since I read The Color Purple when I was in high school. I'm drawn to the epistolary novel, but I'm such a contemporary novelist that it's very rare that you have um, an occasion to put letters in a novel in such a way that it doesn't seem like you're looking for a reason to put letters in a novel. But prisoners, people in prison, letters are so important to them. Um, so that's also part of it. Like when I received, the first time I received a letter from a prisoner was right after I'd written my first book. 
There's a little kind of writerly joke that we always say that once your photograph appears in Essence magazine, six weeks later, you'll receive letters from prisoners. And so <laughs> I got my first letter, and I didn't know what to do with it. And I was speaking to the poet, Nikki Giovanni. I said, Nikki, you know, I got this letter from these guys in prison. And she said, oh, you were in Essence? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> as a matter of fact, I was. But she said to me, that whenever you receive a letter from a person in prison, you must write him back because you, don't, you can't even begin to comprehend how difficult it was for him to send that letter. He has to buy the paper, he has to buy the envelope, he has to buy the stamp. And when you see the letters, they're very often written from margin to margin so as not to waste any paper. Mm -hmm. So having had that experience, I think that helped me decide to put letters in the middle. But the other reason I decided to cover Roy's time in prison in letters is that, I, okay, when you read a novel, you experience vicariously what the characters experience. Prison is brutality. I did not want, as a writer, to spend that much time experiencing brutality. I didn't want you, as a reader, to have to experience brutality. So using the letters, Roy is performing a kindness to Celestial by curating his experiences, yet you can still see the emotional effect of prison without kind of the blow by blow. So I felt like it served two purposes. And also, the letters show you literally what a small canvas they have to try to make a relationship. They're trying to make a relationship out of paper. They've only been married, they haven't even been married two years. So they have only had their paper anniversary, and now they're trying to make their relationship with paper. It's interesting the tension that grows in those letters and fades, the affection that may be fading in a way, the length of the letters changes. They're just beautiful, subtle things that you've, how did you work yourself through those? Um... You know, I don't know. I mean, I felt when I wrote the letters, I really, when I write, when I'm sitting down writing, I try to make Tiari, myself, disappear and allow the characters to behave organically. I try not to send them where I want them to go. I try to let them lead me. And the letter is just becoming shorter and shorter, particularly she's busy. I mean, what's happening in their relationship is that her life is moving forward and his is not. And the letters mean so much more to him. It can't be avoided. I recently reviewed the prison letters of Nelson Mandela mm -hmm. for the New York Times. And even in reading Man the great Nelson Mandela, in his letters, I could see the, how desperately he was holding on you know, to the letters he received and how, how much they meant to him. And he's writing to Winnie Mandela, and she is very, I mean, this is an understatement, I almost said she's busy. I don't even think that begins to, <laughs> to say what she was doing. But, and he's Nelson Mandela, and he's saying, I didn't receive a letter from you this week. Like you could, he felt like a man who was longing but one of the other things in Mandela's letter is that I saw the way he was viewing, the way that he held on was to idealize Winnie Mandela and to think he would write things like, I remember you always as the girl I knew. And you know, she's a grown woman. She's a freedom fighter in her own right. She's doing all of these things. But the way he holds on is to remember her as a girl. And I think that also happened to Roy. I think the way he held on was to imagine her as a kind of ideal, kind of like Penelope in the Odyssey. That's mm -hmm. how he held on. Mm -hmm. So he has to keep writing letters to keep his fantasy understanding of her alive. So another important item in the book is her art, which becomes a metaphor for, I think, a lot of things. Um, should we talk about fabric art or folk art or fine art? Or... Well, she, she's a doll maker. I was originally moved, motivated to write about a doll maker. I have a friend who was a doll maker, and the amount of work that goes into making these kind of fine art dolls is unbelievable. Like she would have to wear these special magnifying glasses to sew these things, and then when she makes them, people act like she's made a toy for little girls. And I think that is a way of thinking about the way women's art is perceived and consumed. Like it's some girly thing you're doing. Like often I'll be on a plane and I'll meet a man and I'll, he'll ask me, you know, what do you do? And I'll say, I'm a writer. And he says, oh, you've written a book? I'll buy it for my wife. <laughs> and 
he doesn't mean to be offensive. He thinks that I'm supposed to understand that what I'm doing has nothing to do with him. Mm -hmm. And I felt like with the dolls, that kind of dynamic is more um, at the forefront. But what I've learned that when someone says that, oh, I'll buy it for my wife, I think, you know, I'm happy that your wife will read this book instead of concentrating on what he's perceiving of my book. Instead, think about the person who actually will read it. So Roy's in prison, and you throw a real curveball while he's in prison. You bring in this other character, Walter. We need to poll the audience. How many people here have not read the book? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, I withdraw the question. Well, let's talk about something that's a little bit... Um, <laughs> there are a lot of writing students in the uh, audience. You have a variety of characters. To an amazing degree, you give each one of them their own dialect, their idiolect, their language. You play with idiom. You know, I, I would read this stuff and I would just stop and try to figure out how you did this because it was so magical. Uh, to create all of these voices, people from different generations, from different social classes, and they all came up as, as absolutely authentic. Uh, how does that happen? How do you make that happen? Well, I listen to people a lot, but also I'm a good mimic. Um, I can imitate people's voices verbally, and do do I'm not doing it. I told you I wasn't <laughs> going to do that. <laughs> but I think, it's, I think it's partly the same skill in listening to all the subtle ways that people um, speak and the idiom they use. Like I can, I can very often guess where people are from. They'll give it away with like one word, and because I'm, I'm interested in and that. And those one words are everywhere. I mean, that's what knocked me over. But it was also was fun spending so much time with the characters, especially generationally. This is a sidebar. Hear me out. I think that this novel is as much about generation gap as anything else. When I wanted to be a writer. I, t I told my parents that I was going to go to school for creative writing. My parents are both, they're both PhDs, but in the social scientists. They're serious people. And I said I wanted to go to school to do, I wanted to, to quit what I was doing, go to school for creative writing. And my daddy said, why? And my mother said, <laughs> why? And I explained that I was not challenged, I didn't feel fulfilled in what I was doing. And my daddy said, you know what your problem is? He said, you never had to pick cotton. He said, when you pick cotton, you don't go out there and say, am I challenged by the cotton? He said, you don't hold that sack and say, these cotton plants are not recognizing my complexity. This is not my niche. He said, you just go out there and pick the goddamn cotton. And I realized that this, the very thing about me that was so frustrating to him was his great gift to me that the sacrifices his generation made, the literal cotton that he picked, made it possible for me from this generation to feel that I want to be fulfilled, I want to be challenged, I want to find my niche. That this was, this is exactly what he wanted for me, although it was really, it was really frustrating. And I think that is at the heart of this book, right? Celestial, the expectations of marriage. You know, she wants to be fulfilled, she wants to be happy, she wants to find her niche. Like she and her family, generationally, everyone's like, you need to pick the cotton. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is, this book is about. And part of the way that I kind of get at it is through the different ways that the people of the generations express themselves. They have a different idiom because they're used to dealing with a different range of challenges. Well, father, Roy Sr. Roy's father is certainly that character. He's the kind of person that you want to sit and drink a glass of whiskey with. He, I liked him. I enjoyed writing him. Is he your favorite character in the book? He's or? not my favorite character because he is, I like him a lot, but I, he, he doesn't show up very much because 
he's so, he's so sure of what he feels and what he believes. And characters are interesting when they're conflicted. He's not conflicted. He, he knows what he wants. He wants his family to be safe. He wants his son to be safe. He's a real charmer and I enjoyed him, but he wasn't a character that challenged. The characters I like best are the characters that, that challenge me. Like? Um, I, I think, for example, I think Roy's cellmate Walter, he's challenging. He's, we can't talk about Walter, I'm sorry. We can talk about him, you just can't. Mm. Talk about him, yeah. The thing, you can't say yeah, the thing. Yeah. But he is a challenging person because he asks the question of, can there be redemption? And how does that work? And I also, I am, well, I'm partial to Celestial, I'm partial to Andre, I like them, I like them all, but I like them best when they are unsure because as they try to be find, as they try to find clarity, then I have to try to find clarity. So by struggling with them, I feel that I as a person am improved. Um, in this world with so much social media and email, readers read books and they write letters to authors. And they sometimes tell the authors they don't like the ending. Or they would do it a different way. Has that happened to you? I'm like, so what are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> like, what was that? Has then anyone I, told you they'd write the I ending say, differently? I say, then I heard somebody amen in out there. I don't know who said it, but I heard you, whoever you are. Um, I do find, you know, I feel that there is something that I like to call the tyranny of genre expectation. And I found that throughout the whole process of writing this book, that because this story is on some level a love triangle, Right, we have yeah. two men in love with the same woman. People sometimes think then that the resolution of the book is who gets the girl, and that I am going to reward a character by giving them the girl as though she's a transferable object. And so part of what I'm really doing is trying to challenge that idea. And so when the book doesn't follow what some people think are the rules, it is disconcerting. Mm -hmm. It, it, you know, they say controversy comes from discomfort and from surprise. And I think that that's what happens. So sometimes people do write to me and they give me their opinion on what they think should happen. And I just thank them for reading the book. Mm -hmm. I have to remember that. Yeah, just thank them. Because they read the book and they cared enough to, to, to write, write to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I just write them back. But I don't argue with them about it. I mean, that's, everyone has how they would like to see it. But the end of a book isn't what you, like I don't think of myself as handing out the goodies for the characters and I don't like to, and also I don't like to judge the characters and I don't like to use the events of the story to punish the characters. Mm -hmm. I feel like all these characters are in a situation that they're making decisions they never should have had to make. And sometimes I feel that maybe with Roy's voice being so clear that the story is sometimes read, like it's easy to read all the characters as Roy reads them. And I really was trying to, to give them all a voice and all evidence that they all were trying to, everyone here is trying to balance their desires with their responsibilities. And I think that when you have a woman looking at her desires and responsibilities as equal, it is also disconcerting. Well, it's interesting because we're, we're only looking at, what, 300 pages, but these characters grow and change so much over that time. And, and I think that you, when you read it carefully, you just see that kind of evolution, um, which I think is hard to, to, to create. Uh, you have a list of, pre-readers uh, pre or people who helped you at the end of the book. It's a long list. So you, you had a lot of feedback. Was that how you maneuvered through this whole problem? Or? The last year and a half, I didn't show anyone else the book. I decided that I had to figure out for myself what I wanted this book to be about. And I was stranded 50 pages from the end for a year. That was awful. It was like... It was as though me and this book were in a relationship and we, we couldn't afford to move out. <laughs> it was on the couch. It wasn't speaking to me. I was looking at it every day. It was a real problem. I couldn't bring any other books home. <laughs> it was such a problem. And I realized, though, that 
the mistake, the reason I couldn't finish the book is that I was letting the character of Roy, I was letting Roy tell me what the book is about. Roy thinks this book is about how he can regain what he's lost. And he thinks that what he's lost is his job, his car, his woman, his status. But what he has really lost is his citizenship in his own life. And we measure our citizenship by what we can give. And he had forgotten that he's in a situation where he can give, where he should give. He had, because he just had suffered so much that he forgot, he just forgot that part of life. His dad tries to tell him by saying, you know, you have to tell me where, when, when you're coming home. Mm -hmm. He completely forgot that other people might be worried about him because he's so busy trying to heal himself and get the other people around him to heal him. And he forgot that he is a human being with things to offer the people around him. And once he realizes that, then he can move forward in his life. And once I realized that, I was so excited. I came home, the book was on the couch, and I, I basically told Roy, I have figured out the problem with the book. You have gotta do something for someone else. And, and I felt like Roy, the character, resisted me. I think Roy was like, no, I don't have to do anything. I've been through so much. And I was like, no, if you don't, do this, we can't finish this book. And I felt like he hung out there, he was mad at me for a while, and I was thinking, I'm gonna have to return the money to the publisher. So I was like, no more brunch, you know, no more Uber, no more mimosa, but we have to save this money because I can't figure out the right ending. And I would rather not publish a book than publish a wrong book. Mm -hmm. But then I sat down, I rolled some paper in my typewriter, and I said, I'm just gonna give it a try with this new understanding. And I just started typing away. And then it's just like I started typing faster. And I finished the book in about two days. I had to buy a new ribbon for my typewriter. I had that, to... that... <laughs> that might have been the biggest challenge in the uh, finding a ribbon, right? No, no, I have an excellent typewriter doctor. <laughs> so six years. Six years. Um, it was four years overdue. I kept saying, I need, I kept saying, I need three more months. I need three more months. And they just kept extending it because I published with Algonquin Books, an independent publisher. And my publisher at Algonquin, she says, no book before it's time. You'll get that book right when the book is right. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah no, they're a really terrific publisher. So what are you going to do now? I'm going to write another book. <laughs> I do one thing. <laughs> <laughs> you also teach creative writing to graduate students. I do. How does being a working writer influence what you do with your students in classrooms? How does one inform the other? Well, I do feel like my students um, keep me honest. My novel, every one of my novels, I've had some incredible hurdle to cross before I could publish it. We're talking it. about how many years? Um, have how many years I've been teaching? No, the novels and the teaching has gone on with all the novels. So right, I've been teaching. I mean, I took my first teaching job in 2002, and I published my first book that same year. Okay. I've always taught. But like with my novel before An American Marriage, it's called Silver Sparrow. It almost didn't get published. There's this computer program called BookScan. You know mm -hmm, BookScan. Mm -hmm. oh, I hate book scan. Okay, book scan is this thing where they can put your name in the computer and it tells them how many books you sold. Before book scan, as you know, you used to could act successful and they would think you were successful. <laughs> but now with book scan, they can put your name in the computer. They have it on their phones now. I met someone with book scan on their phone. So if they meet you at a cocktail party, they just like dip behind the curtain and look at your book scan. So my book scan was bad. Well, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. And so my publisher cut me loose. My first publisher, they cut me loose. They were not interested in me. And then they took my existing books out of print. So it was like one day someone made a decision to take my entire career from me. And I didn't even know it was coming. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And the book was three quarters of the way done when they informed me that they weren't interested in me anymore. And it really was my students that kept me writing. Because I always tell my students, you write the book not because you think you can publish it. You write the book because you think it's the book that needs to be written. So how could I face them every day if I was going to put aside my book because of some computer program called BookScan? So I finished the book. And I am a person that believes that with art, when you do your part, the universe will meet you halfway. So mm -hmm. I wrote 
I finished the book and I put it in a drawer. I thought it, was, I thought it wasn't going to be published because of the book scan. I went to a writing conference and I gave, it was the last reading I was invited to do. And I got there and I was embarrassed because I thought I wouldn't have any books to sign and because I was out of print. And so, but I went anyway because I felt that if I had canceled, it would, it would penalize the people who came after me. So I went and I got to the thing and the bookseller had four copies of my books, two of each one. And I said, oh my goodness, where did you get these? And the bookseller said, so they came in this box. And I looked at the box and there was my father's distinctive handwriting. He said, he said I sent my copies and then I, I went over to your uncle. You know, he hadn't even touched them, those were new. And so, <laughs> He, so then daddy said, you just sign those books, baby. And then if someone asks you, you say, oh my, I think I've sold out. So <laughs> I gave my reading. I sat down, I signed my four mm -hmm. copies and a woman came up to me and she said she wanted a book. And I said, oh my, I've sold out. And she said, really? Because I heard your books are out of print. I heard that because of your book scan, you can't get a book contract. And I was so embarrassed because I thought that I had, you know, hidden this. And I was so embarrassed. I just, I, I just wanted to cry. I didn't know what to do. But the lady said, I think I could help you. And you know, when you're on book tour, you meet some strange people. You don't know what that person is suggesting. <laughs> But she was older than me, so I said, yes, ma'am. And she took me by the hand, and she took me through the crowd, and she put my hand in the hand of Elizabeth Charlotte, who's the publisher of Algonquin Books. And I was worried because I knew about the book scan, and I just wanted to get away. But Elizabeth Charlotte held my hand, and she wouldn't let me go. And she said, what's your book about? And I said, oh, it's about two girls. They have the same dad, but only one knows he has a secret family. She said, well, you should send it to me. But I didn't even want to because I was so worried. And I was, I was trying to get away from her. She said, but don't go. Tell me, how do you know Judy? And I said, oh, I don't know anyone named Judy. And she said, no, 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 Judy Bloom, who just introduced us. <laughs> It was as though my nerdy childhood <laughs> had come to rescue me in my time of need. And then after that, I mean, like three days later, I had a book contract and it was like the bad things never happened, which is part of why when it came time to write an American marriage, I wanted to write a novel for the first time that was outside of my autobiography because I felt like my career had been given back to me for a reason. And what was I going to write the next book about? I felt like I needed to try to, you know, move the needle in some way because, I mean, I had been given this opportunity. So can we go back to how teaching informs writing? Look at you. And, yes. Or, or should we just move <laughs> Look forward? Look at this one. <laughs> I mean, when you're talking I'm about... I'm going to go back to Waller if you don't cooperate. <laughs> if, you, um, if you talk about writing all the time, it helps you write if you're talking about it. If you like teaching, I think people who don't like teaching, it hurts their writing. Whenever you're doing something you don't want to do, it hurts your writing. But I enjoy teaching. My parents are both professors, so I'm, I'm kind of in the family business. Um, I, just, I just love my students. I mean, I love the teachers that I had. The first time I met a writer, I was a student at Spelman College. I met a writer, and she was my teacher. And she demonstrated to me what it was to be a, a working writer. And so I so treasured that relationship. And I never had a feeling that as her student, I was somehow you know, cramping her style as a writer. So I came to understand that that was just integrated into part of being a writer was mentoring young people. So we've talked about publishing and the problems. Um, you're on what, day 15 of this tour? I've been on tour since February 6th. Oh. And I do it all with a carry-on bag. <laughs> <laughs> Should I tell them how much that weighs? <laughs> Do not listen to him. It is light <laughs> as a feather. <laughs> so in how many more days? I'm on the road until after November 19th, I get to take the holidays off, and then I'll start back up on January 7th. So this is just part of the writing life. This is what it means to be a commercial writer. I, I don't um, mean by commercial, but this is what um, publishers expect? Um, actually, I feel really fortunate to be given this big of a tour. Most people don't get to go anywhere with their books. Nowadays, they're telling people just tweet about it. So yeah. I feel very fortunate to be able to meet so many, to go out and meet so many people, but I am eager to 
kind of go back home and sit down and start to write again because t when you're on tour, you're so invested in the past book that it's hard to get your mind into a new book. So the new book, what is it? Where is it? Do you know yet? I just published this one. <laughs> Didn't I say I want to get home and start a new book? Well, I'm just used to this question because I finish a book and a and week do you late. Like, and do you like it? No, you don't. <laughs> so let's go back to Walter. <laughs> Oh, for real? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say this about Walter. I am a person who enjoys a novel with a lot of plot. I think it's because I do. I read a lot of mysteries, and I like a novel that moves. I think that we make a mistake in thinking that writing that's serious is also sleepy. I feel like novels should reflect real life, and real life is full of twists and unexpected things. And that is absolutely unexpected, but a very... I didn't know that was coming either, actually. When that was revealed, I was as shocked as Roy. I was like, get out. So you just woke up one morning and Walter... Um... Uh, uh, easy, easy. <laughs> I, no, I think uh, I, you were sitting at your manual typewriter and Walter jumped feel, out of the... Do you feel like he's mocking my typewriters? <laughs> I was just typing away and I don't know, it just... Sometimes an idea, like I get in the zone. I like to have the same feeling of breathless anticipation as a writer that I want you to have as a reader. So therefore, I don't outline, I don't know what's going to happen. I write to find the story. And also, I write every novel to ask myself some kind of question. So I was very curious as to, when I was working on this, about the way people make how situation can make relationships in family. And so since I was wondering about that, I think that particular super exciting, juicy, shocking plot twist revealed itself to me in that way. Your characters are so complete. And, and as but, I was reading it, I was wondering if you um, did character sketches before or that it just comes out in the course of writing also, the book. Also, I rewrite the book so many times. So I write the book from beginning to end. Then I write it again. And so when I come back to the beginning, after having written it all the way through, I know new things about the person. It's just like in real life. When you meet someone, you have an initial impression, and you know a little bit about them. You draw clues from what you see. But after you've known them a while, you can think back to the first day you met them and see things differently. But with a book, you have the opportunity to then shade it in. So I just keep writing it and shading it in over and over until the book feels complete. So, Andre, can we talk about Andre? Yeah, is, we can talk about is, Andre. is he on the uh, table? Look at you. Yes, we can talk about Andre. There is a second male character in the book. His name is? Andre? Andre, yeah. <laughs> um, in the beginning, he's just sort of an outside character, but you see him slowly, and I, I don't think he's manipulating or using the situation at all, but. Uh, it's a love triangle, y'all. Thank you for that. I just, okay, yep. go ahead. Um, did he suddenly appear or was... Oh no, I knew Andre all along. I knew, I knew, I knew from the beginning that Celestial would have a lover. And I did wrestle though with who it should be because I feel that she's in such a situation where her life and her desires are so policed by the other characters but also by society. And I thought, okay, because sometimes people say, of all the people, why did it have to be Andre? Now, but who says that? People, people. I've been on tour since February 6th, people. <laughs> but, but what I think is this, I really feel there is no right lover for her to have. If, if it was a new person, people would say, who is this stranger who walked up in here and disrupted this existing thing? And then it's Andre and they say, who is Andre? He's been here all along. Because I feel there is no right way. There is no right way for a woman to choose herself, particularly when her husband has such trauma. And so it was really, and I got frustrated because I felt like the boy next door is a perfectly acceptable romantic trope. The entire genre of rom-coms is about the boy next, that's why they have <laughs> boys next door. But. 
For Celestial, everything, the Roy's incarceration tilts everything where the, the rules don't apply to her. Like one of the things I was looking at when I was rewriting it is that I was reading other novels about marriage. And I noticed that a lot of novels about marriage where the question is whether or not a woman is fulfilled by her marriage, almost always they're novels about um, middle class or upper middle class white women and they are unfulfilled in their marriage. And when you read it and they leave the marriage, you feel like, yes, you know, get free, live your life. And I was like, why are there not novels like this about black women? There are novels about black women in marriage, but usually if she's leaving the marriage, it's because the marriage is violent. Mm -hmm. Like she's running for her life, not just running for her freedom. And I realized that the reason it's easier to root for the women in the novels by the white women is that the man is not in trouble. There's no sense that her leaving will have kind of far-reaching consequences for him in that way, where when she chooses herself, it's, there's no crime in it. And this novel is intersectional, where there's more than one thing happening that, so Celestial is a woman who wants her life and career, much like I want my life and career, like I'm sure many of you want your lives and career, but the experience of Roy makes this basic desire almost criminal for her. Like she is so conflicted in the end, and I think that gives so much power to the story. You know, when I first wrote it, she wasn't that conflicted, but then I was in the grocery store around the corner from my house, and I ran into this guy. I had only gone out like on four dates with him, and I ran into him over there by the rotisserie chickens. You know the rotisserie yeah, chickens? Yeah. And he was over there buying a rotisserie, looking sad buying a rotisserie chicken, like, you left me, you only went out on four dates with me, now I have to eat a rotisserie chicken. He looked so sad. <laughs> and for a minute, I was like, oh no, I've caused this man to have to eat a rotisserie chicken. And he wasn't even my wrongfully incarcerated husband, you know? And so I realized that if this man just dolefully reaching for the rotisserie chicken caused me to feel a moment of conflict, then of course, in this novel, Celestial will be deeply conflicted. I'm speechless. <laughs> We have, your characters are, are in first person, and you sustain that. And was that an automatic choice right from the beginning? I've looked at your other books, I've read your other books, and there is a pattern that you've sort of established for yourself. Does, does that sound right? Well, I do like, I do like a first person. I enjoy doing it. Sometimes I'll switch it up because sometimes you almost feel pressure to demonstrate your range. But whenever you feel, pre whenever you're doing something because you feel pressure, you're not listening to the story. I do think that different characters, depending on their personality, lend themselves to different points of view. Um, like in my first novel, I do third person, second person, and first person. And I do third person because that character, she's kind of, She's childish, she's a kid, but she's kind of childish, and so if she were to have a first person, we would have to listen to her muse endlessly about whether she'll be invited to parties. So I decided to take the microphone away from her and <laughs> tell the story as a third person narration. But I feel like all three of these characters, I just felt like they were in a position where they could articulate their needs, desires, and ambition. So I just let them all have first person. So you've told me in Murder Mysteries you like the, the body within 20 pages, uh, right? I do. Yeah. Well, I, what it is, I don't like a murder mystery where, I, don't, I like a murder mystery where the characters are motivated by love, jealousy, money. I don't like, have you noticed so many mysteries now? Lust. Involve serial killers. Mm. Serial killers don't have a motive, right? And so then it's all about the detective figuring out how to catch a murderer, but that's not character development in the way that I like. I like the murder in the first 20 pages and we spend the whole rest of the book solving it. Well, I noticed in one of your books, the first paragraph talks about uh, a, the character is talking about her mother who wrapped gifts. And this man walks in and he buys a knife that he's going to give to his... Wife for their wedding anniversary. And any time there's a blade, something's wrong. Yes, it said mother knew that something was wrong between a man and a woman when the gift was a blade. Yeah, that's the line. <laughs> and, 
and, you know, and, and then you just, you're caught. I mean, you know, the body isn't on page 20, the body is in the first paragraph, and you just sort of run forward with that. Is that planned, or does that all come out of rewriting, rewriting, rewriting to get that right? I do feel that you, do, you know how to begin a story once you, for me, once I know what the ending is. Because the beginning and the end have to communicate, and when you write the original beginning, you don't know what the end is. Like even with um, an American marriage, it begins with Roy's hand of two kinds of people, those who leave home and those who don't. But it wasn't until I got to the very end that I knew that was the question of the novel. So then I, so I wrote that, that was the last thing I wrote. So, so the theme actually, the overriding theme for the book comes to you when the book's sort of completed. I'm learning what the theme is as I go. In the I process. Go. Right. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. But that's why it takes so long, I think. Because I, I'm going down all these wrong paths and everything. But I write to learn something, and it takes a long time to learn something. No, it makes perfect sense. I mean, I, I have that experience. You don't really know what it's about until you've written it, until you've worked it out intellectually, emotionally, whatever. Um, part of this is about the South. Part of this is about a certain amount of entitlement with some of these characters. There is a sort of social uh, struggle. Um, Roy seems a little bit entitled in the beginning. He's sort of a women's man. Um, well, it is a novel about the South. I grew up in Atlanta, and I, I wrote my first novel about growing up in Atlanta during the child murders. And your first novel is very often your obvious story, right? Like, I grew up in this time. Two children in my class were killed by a serial killer in the, um, in the late 80s, I mean the early 80s. And so I wrote about that. But then I kept, as I left the South, I became more self-consciously a Southern writer because I realized how much people don't understand the South. Like I live in Brooklyn. I tell people I'm from Georgia. They act like I got up here on the Underground Railroad. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, are you all right? How are your parents? Are they okay? And, <laughs> and so I really started writing the urban South as I know it. And this is a novel about the South. And Roy is from one small town in the South, and he moves to Atlanta, much like my father was from a small town in Louisiana. And he didn't migrate north. He migrated to Atlanta because Atlanta was seen as the promised land mm -hmm. for, for black Americans. And I really wanted to write about that kind of journey. But I also am very interested in class. You know, I've read articles that say most Americans don't know anyone from another social class. But I think that particularly for black Americans, because of all the advances of the civil rights movement, like I said, my daddy picked cotton as a boy but he ended up getting a PhD. So that's an incredible class leap for one generation. I have 43 first cousins. So I have relatives who are from various class backgrounds and they're my cousins. So there's a lot more discourse, a lot more back and forth. And I was interested in looking at the way that affects people's personal relationships. So it's interesting because the, the, uh, the book in many ways is universal marriage, relationships, uh, and fiction is always filled with problems. You know, if it was a marriage where you had, or if they had had, if, if Roy and Celestial had the perfect marriage, as Roy sort of lays out in the first chapter, the first chapter we were talking about is sort of um, a little bit boring because it's, I'm sorry. <laughs> Because it's pardon, the perfect sir. setup. You know, here is Roy, who is a ladies' man. He's a, gradu he's a graduate of... Morehouse College. But he, I do think that happy marriages are only interesting to the people in them. Well, that's... <laughs> and they do nothing for fiction, right? I mean, our job but, is to get people in trouble. Well, well, I say this. I do think it was important to me that they not have a perfect or happy... Or, oh, I think they were enjoying themselves, but not a perfect marriage because I, one, I wanted to avoid, do y'all watch Dateline? Dateline undermines my faith in humanity. You know, it always starts off, they were the perfect couple. And then, <laughs> and I wanted to avoid that trope, but also I wanted to avoid the idea that, because I knew that Roy, I knew from the start that Roy was going to be wrongfully incarcerated. And I did not want to try to make him 
earn our sympathy by being exemplary. Like I didn't want to employ respectability to make him a worthy victim. He is worthy of our sympathy because he's a human being to whom something has Awful happened. Awful happened, yeah. So where were we going with this? You were telling me my book was boring and then I was, <laughs> and then I was like trying not to be offended because we're on stage. <laughs> How about I read? That would be good. Okay, I'm gonna read Do a Do I get bit. to pick or do you? <laughs> no, I get to pick. <laughs> I'm gonna read a little bit from um, the day that Roy is arrested and then I'll read his first letter to her. And this is from Celestial's point of view. What I know is this, they didn't believe me. 12 people and not one of them took me at my word. There in the front of the room, I explained that Roy couldn't have raped the woman in room 206 because we had been together. I told them about the magic fingers that wouldn't work, about the movie that played on the snowy television. The prosecutor asked me what we had been fighting about. Rattled, I looked to Roy and to both our mothers. Banks objected, so I didn't have to answer, but the pause made it appear that I was concealing something rotten at the pit of our very young marriage. Even before I stepped down from the witness stand, I knew that I had failed him. Maybe I wasn't appealing enough, not dramatic enough, too, not from around here. Who knows? Uncle Banks, coaching me, had said, now is not the time to be articulate. Now is the time to give it up. No filter, all heart. No matter what you're asked, what you want the jury to see is why you married him. I tried, but I didn't know how to be anything other than well-spoken in front of strangers. I wish I could have brought a selection of my art, the Man Moving series, all images of Roy. I would say, this is who he is to me. Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he gentle? But all I had were words which are light and flimsy as air. As I took my seat, not even the black lady juror would look at me. It turns out that I watch too much television. I was expecting a scientist to come and testify about DNA. I was waiting for a pair of handsome detectives to burst into the courtroom at the last minute, whispering something urgent. Everyone would see that this was a big mistake, a major misunderstanding. We would all be shaken but appeased. I fully believed that I would leave the courtroom with my husband beside me. Secure in our home, we would tell people how no black man is really safe in America. But 12 years is what they gave him. We would be 43 when he was released. Roy understood that 12 years was an eternity because he sobbed right there at the defendant's table. His knees gave way and he fell into his chair. The judge paused and demanded that Roy bear this news on his feet. He stood again and cried, not like a baby, but in a way that only a grown man can cry, from the bottom of his feet, up through his torso, and finally through his lips. When a man wails like that, you know it's all the tears he was never allowed to shed, from Little League disappointment to teenage heartbreak, all the way up to whatever injured his spirit just last year. As Roy howled, my fingers kept worrying a rough patch of skin beneath my chin, a souvenir of scar tissue. When they did what I remember as kicking in the door, what everyone else remembers as opening it with the key, after the door was open, however it was opened, we were both pulled from the bed. They dragged Roy into the parking lot and I followed, lunging for him, wearing nothing but the white slip. Someone pushed me to the ground and my chin hit the pavement. My slip rode up showing everything to everyone and my tooth sank into the soft skin of my bottom lip. Roy was on the asphalt beside me, barely beyond my grasp, speaking words that didn't reach my ears. I don't know how long we lay there, parallel like burial plots, husband, wife, what God has brought together, let no man tear asunder. Wow. There you We're gonna go into question and answer now, and people will be circulating around with microphones, and I have been told that I am to point to the microphone and not to the person with the raised hand. I don't quite understand how this is going to work. <laughs> There's a microphone and a microphone and... Oh. Okay, I'm pointing at that person. There, with the there's a microphone hand. right there. 
Well, I think the book should be called American Marriages because uh, what struck me is not just the marriage between Celestial and Roy, but also Roy's parents, the Celestial marriage, and Andrew's parents, and how each one of them had found a, diff a separate balance in that marriage. And it was just wonderful. I mean, I, I have so many other things to, to tell you. But it, just thank you. It was oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Hello again. Hello, my friend from the state of Georgia. All right. So, for the record, I would say that I didn't find anything in your book to be boring. Thank Maybe you. Maybe because I'm from the South as well. <laughs> but you alluded to a lot of books going all the way back to Homer. So um, I kind of dabble a little bit in writing, and I find there's a constant dance between reading and writing. How do you balance the two? You know, I could read all day, but you got to stop at some point and write. How do you balance those two activities, especially also being a teacher? Well, I read, I write in the morning, and I, I don't, I read the rest of the day. It's really just, for me, just a matter of the time of day. I write early in the morning, like I get up like at five, and I write from like five to eight. And I don't write every day, though. I feel like I, sh I feel like I have to say that all the time. I don't write every day. I think that we make a mistake when we tell young people, and people who are not young, that you have to write every day. Because it means that people who work or raising children, doing elder care, who are doing all these things, they feel like they can't be writers because they don't have a lot of leisure time. So I feel like I should always tell people, you don't have to write every day, just write frequently. I write about three times a week. When other people are in the gym, that's when I do my writing, about three times a week. <laughs> and that's plenty. But I read in the afternoons, and I read at night. Thank you. We have a question up here. And I don't watch TV. That also gives me more time, except for Dateline. Hi, I just want. Is this on? Okay, I just wanted to thank you so much for your book. Um, I'm an avid reader. I'm up here. Oh, okay. Okay, um, your your book is in my top five, um, and I've been reading since I was a little kid. Uh, what fascinated me about it was the complexity of the three characters, and also, um, I, it really opened my eyes to how easily someone can be incarcerated for something they didn't. Um, which is always, I was befuddled when I would hear that happen in the news. Did this concept, uh, you were delving a lot into people being jailed when they shouldn't be, um, does this make you want to write another book on that sort of a theme of, about people being jailed when they shouldn't be? You know, I don't think I will probably write again about people being wrongfully incarcerated, but I do imagine that incarceration will weave its way back through because, you know, I always say they call it mass incarceration because it happens to so many people and so many Americans are just barely one degree of separation away from someone who's incarcerated. So I feel that if I continue to write contemporary fiction, it will just come back organically. Probably won't be at the center of a book again like this, but probably like on the edges, I think. But I was surprised when I was doing my research, because when you watch Dateline, it seems like, it seems like, it makes the legal system seem so precise. You know, like they'll say, but a button left at the crime scene would soon reveal an unlikely suspect. But in real life, that's not how it happens at all. And I do think that television narratives and even mysteries, which I enjoy so much, make us think that they're, the system works better than it does. Microphone back there. First of all, I want to say you're very brilliant. I am so impressed. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I wish I could write even a quarter of as well as you do. I wish I could articulate myself as well, but I feel like I'm just kind of miss that in life. But I am a good storyteller, and I'm going to buy a copy of your book for my wife. <laughs> but I'm going to buy it for myself, too, on Kindle, because I can do Kindle easier than the book. But I'm impressed that you're using a typewriter. Um, while I was in prison for 12 years for a crime I didn't commit, I had to use a manual typewriter. I know that aches of it. It could hold six pages, but it's still so hard to type on. But I have written a book about me going to prison for 12 years for a crime I didn't commit. And someone told me I had to come here and see you. And my life seemed so busy. I was just like, oh, oh, oh. But my wife just kind of pushed me to come here. I was like, 
I'm so glad I came because I'm just floored by the way you can so well articulate it all. It makes me want to just start over and rewrite this whole thing, which I'm probably going to have to do anyways, because <laughs> the guy who sent me to prison for a crime and it commits trying to sue me now for writing this, so I think I have to change his name from demon to something less derogatory. <laughs> but anyways, thanks again. I want to give you a copy of this if I can. I would love it. I'll hand Please. it on. Someone will get it to you. Thanks a lot Thank for coming Thank you so much. Here. Make sure you sign it. Okay, I'll do that first. Thank, Thank you. you. Question right back there. Tavery, welcome to Traverse City from Michigan Writers. Uh, we heard that the book has been optioned for the screen. And if we think about when we go to the movies, in a marriage, we see how the couple comes together. That's really interesting. And then the end of a marriage. So I'm wondering how you see that long middle, how that will be depicted with this story, if you have ideas about that, how you want that to look. You know, I, was, I met with a um, woman that's working on the screenplay, and she was explaining to me, yes, that in a film, you have to watch, the people have to do stuff. Like she said, like for example, she said the end of a book can be someone having an epiphany. But an epiphany looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> but you cannot have a movie end with someone just doing that. They have to do something. And when she explained that to me, it made, me, it made it really clear that I don't know how to write screenplays. Because I was going to lobby to be a part of it, but I realized, but I think that, I, what do you think about, like, I do hope the letters have voiceover, oh, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. dear Roy, you know, I, I hope so. I hope, and I imagine at the end, because the ends with letters would also be that kind of, that kind of voiceover, but I imagine that they're going to have to add scenes that I didn't write to make that work. And the thing, I think when your book is made to film, you have to just let go of some of the control and just trust, like hope that you get a director and a screenwriter that you trust their vision and let it be their project. But it's really tricky because more people will see a film than will read the book. And so they will think the film is the book. So even though I'm trying to let it go and understand that it's someone else's project, it will be understood to be my project. I'm a little stressed, as you can tell. <laughs> Up there. Hi there. Um, our book club really enjoyed your book. <laughs> and at dinner tonight, we were discussing it. And we were wondering, and maybe I missed this, um, was the woman that Roy supposedly had raped, was she white or was she black? You know, it is funny that you asked that because the, film, the screenwriter asked me the same thing because we're going to have to cast somebody in the role. And they thought she was white at dinner. So we're kind of mixed, mixed decisions. Should we poll? Yeah. Should we take a poll? <laughs> How many people thought she was white? How many people didn't think she was white? How many people never thought about it until I just brought it up? <laughs> It's funny, I did not declare it, and I thought that I had kind of gotten by with that until my editor wrote the copy for the back of the book, and he wrote, and it, it was so Dateline, he was like, Roy is incarcerated for the rape of a white woman, you know, like that, like he, he just like pronounced it, and I said, I did not say that, and he had never considered that I didn't say it until I said I didn't say it, it was kind of awkward, but... Um, <laughs> I did not declare it because I felt that we could get sidetracked and end up going down that rabbit hole and not be able to get to the rest of the story. So I tried to just kind of keep it kind of oblique. And also, it was, this was also a nod to Toni Morrison. I adore Toni Morrison. I'm always trying to get her attention through my writing. And she has a story, short story called On Recitative about two girls who are in foster care. And it's about their relationship all the way through their adulthood, but they're always, they have so much racial tension in their relationship, and she never tells you which one is black and which one is white. And so I'm kind of winking at her in that. But I also just, I just was, didn't want to get sidetracked, you know? Interesting. And one other point that's probably more like just commentary to me, and this is probably, I don't want to get political really, but it's, your book to me resonated very much because of what was happening in the media and with white men in our society, and I don't want anyone to be mad at me for saying this, but um, it just seems like they're so vilified and they're more guilty before they're innocent um, in certain situations nowadays. And your book seemed very much on top of that, 
from the other side of it, which is a different kind of race and different type of person. It just seemed very relevant to what's going on in the world today, but maybe more towards the white man in society. And it was just very interesting to read your book with that perspective, and I really enjoyed it. It was very cool. Thank you. I mean, I thought when I was very interesting, because, you know, historically, um, there is just this long, I mean, it's very difficult for to have anyone arrested for rape. I mean, that's part of how Me Too came to be, is that very few people are, very few people who are raped see a conviction. And, but one, the thing about rape as a crime, particularly this kind of stranger rape that I talk about in the book, is that it is often used as a proxy for another thing, right? Like, so she misidentified Roy, but the reason why they were so quick to roll with that is, you know, it's just racism, right? Like it's, when it comes to wrongful incarceration, I do think that the things we see in the news is very few people are going to prison. People's reputations are hurt, but they are not going to prison. People go to prison are large, people go to prison are largely working class people and people of color. So I do think that there, there really is a difference. And I don't think it's the other side of that. I think we're talking about a very long historical track record. Over there. Hi, I have um, three children and they all have different skin colors and um, two are adopted. And the, the one with the darkest skin has been arrested twice and um, I didn't expect this. And when he got in trouble the first time, it was five friends perpetrated and two were prosecuted, him and his African-American friend. And um, seeing the different experiences my children had, I see that he's also given up on the system. He doesn't want to vote. He's not, how, how, do, we keep, how do we stop this? How do we keep? people motivated, and how do we bring awareness to people that this doesn't happen to? I mean, I do think it is a really challenging thing. Because, you know, people sometimes ask me about how did you decide to write about incarceration, and they expect me to, you know, have like some kind of very specific kind of lightning bolt moment that made me aware of, you know, the way that the justice system affects certain communities. But I always say, where I'm from, I didn't have a lightning bolt because it's raining all the time. And I think that, I think literature actually is a way that people raise awareness. I think that people are more comfortable talking about hypothetical people than actual people. And I think that fiction has that as a benefit. But I think otherwise, I think just talking to, telling your story about your children to other people, people who know you know you're not making that up. I think that's a big problem that people can't quite believe that something is real. But as far as keeping your son motivated, I think that it's just important to let him know you believe him, and that he's not making this up, and to believe that his vote and all the other things that he wants to do, that they do matter, that they make a difference. I would encourage him to mentor young people. Nothing encourages you and makes you feel more consequential than when you can see the difference you can make in the life of someone younger than you. Other questions? Back here. This is a fellow Atlantan. Oh. Professor Jones, uh, my friend and I are both alumna of Emory University, and we're very happy to uh, have you in Traverse City. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, I loved your book. I wanted to, if you don't mind, read your own words back to you uh -oh. and ask you for a comment on this passage, which I was thoroughly frozen over. The vast generosity of women is a mysterious tunnel, and nobody knows where it leads. The writing on the walls spells out trick questions, and as a man, you must know that you cannot reason your way out. This is in Roy's point of view toward almost the culmination of the book, and I wondered, because it seemed to me at that point he had, he had begun to realize that he could not reason out his marriage. I'd just like your comment on whether I'm a fielder, what happened there? 
when I wrote that, I was, you know, he, he finds his life is mysterious, but he had not realized until that moment how much women's generosity has protected him in his life because he feels like because he does not have what he reads as Celestial's loyalty, that he's been given nothing. But his mother has taken care of him all of his life. And Celestial looked after him, and that's the reason his bills are still being paid. And also, Davina, like, women have shepherded him through, but he's experienced it so easily that he didn't, real he didn't realize that it was a gift, right? It was almost like when... Do you remember the time when you, as a child, you realized that your mother didn't work for you? Like when you realized that your mother's generosity was optional. <laughs> but when you're a child, you just think it's just, her generosity is just part of your life. And I think that's what happened to him, that he realized that and that you can't, and once you receive that kind of generosity, you can't think your way through it. You have to feel your way through it. And that's when he is just about to figure out the way forward. Question up there. Yo. <laughs> so, just wondering, is to, I aspire to be a novelist one day. So, just wondering, is 2,000 words a worthy goal a day? 2,000? Yeah. Do you like it? How does it feel to you? Do you like writing that much a day? I love writing. If you, if you like writing 2,000 words, see, I don't set word goals, I set time goals because I can't control how many words I write. I can only control how long I try and how hard I try. So I said time goals. But if word goals work for you, then it's fine. You know, a page a day is a book in a year. But I don't want you to try to meet your 2,000 word goal and start throwing any kind of words out there because you set that as a goal. You see what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, because like I, I teach, right? When I teach undergraduates, I'll tell them they have to turn in so many words and they give me those words, but you know, it's not necessarily 2,000 good words. <laughs> so I'm going to say, shoot for 500. Shoot for, give me, I'd rather you give me 500 good words. Do that. Okay, you can, you can do that? Yep. Okay. Aye, aye, madam. This is our last question for the evening. Question there. Well, I want to say thank you so much for sharing this story with us. Um, and you talked a lot about your process and writing and rewriting. Um, and you also, I was wondering, what, what did an American marriage teach you and what did you learn from these characters? I think that what, on a personal level, this book taught me, it showed me what I was made of, really, because six years, I never spent more than two and a half years on a book. And it taught me that I am more persistent than I thought. But it also showed me what I believe as an artist because like it's you know I make jokes about how I was gonna save up to repay the advance but I thought that I was prepared to walk away from my publishing career if I could not solve the challenge of this book and I realized that being a writer is more important to me than being an author and I mean and I really I mean, I felt like so many people want to write one book. And I had, at this point, been given three. And I thought that I couldn't finish the fourth. And I was like, I'm grateful for the three. Like, I really had come to that place within myself. So that was something that I learned. But I think what the characters really taught me was that we all struggle to try to figure out how to be the best people we can be and how to take care of ourselves and how is it that you how can you is it possible to take care of yourself and take care of other people and I realized that the answer is yes that care may not look the way you think it's going to look and I also found myself this is going to sound strange revisiting the great wisdom of the Rolling Stones who said you can't always get what you want but sometimes you get what you need <laughs>